A lot of the dysfunction that we have within families goes back to a dysfunction with dealing with emotions that God has given us. Uh, Chip writes about how there, just about everything that we experience, it all goes back to these eight feelings that God gives us to live out our humanity, one of which is hurt. And the benefit of when we're hurt, what it does is it names our woundedness. Like, we can think, if I feel hurt, okay, what is it that I'm hurt about? And I can begin to heal and begin to deal with it because that hurt tells me i got to deal with something emotionally right now. If I don't deal with that hurt properly, it'll end up in an impairment, an emotional impairment. And in this case, hurt will lead to resentment. If I'm feeling sad, it's a chance for me to think, okay, why am I feeling sad? Uh, sadness teaches us to value and honor what is present or what is missed like I'm missing out on something it teaches me to search for that which will ultimately make me glad but if I live in my sadness I just embrace it and say I'm going to stay sad forever it's going to lead to self-pity if I'm feeling lonely that's a good thing because God said about Adam it's not good for man to be alone it teaches us to ask for help and to reach out and to have relationships with others that loneliness drives us to a healthy place but a lot of times when lonely say well I don't care I don't need anybody else I'm just standing on my own I'm not going to talk about my feelings it can lead to apathy to where you don't care about yourself and others and that can lead to self-harm and harm of others Uh, when we live in fear like it's a good thing if I'm walking down a trail and I see a rattlesnake there okay it doesn't make me brave if I decide to step by that rattlesnake okay that makes me stupid okay Like, it's good to have a healthy fear of rattlesnakes. And so there are things in our lives that that we should fear, okay? And it helps us to practice and prepare for, for things that may cause us harm, okay? But if we live in constant fear, it manifests itself in anxiety or rage towards others. Uh, when we feel angry, man, I always say I never want to hire a staff member who, who isn't angry. I love angry staff members. Why? A healthy anger leads us to tell the truth to people. Like, I'm angry about something. I need you to know it. We need to work through this problem. It also, healthy anger dares us to hope and it rouses us a desire if we see something that is unjust to make it right. That's what anger does. It propels us just like when Jesus went to the temple and he saw the poor being taken advantage of where they have defamed the the worship of God in the temple. He got angry about that and he did something about it. But if we live in that anger, it can lead to depression in our own lives or perfectionism like I got to be perfect. I'm always angry. I'm always striving for perfection. None of us can be that. We can live in shame, okay? Now, when we mess up, we can feel shame, like, oh, man, I'm not good enough on my own, and that awakens us to the humility that we feel, that we should be dependent on others, that we are human, we do make mistakes, but if we don't resolve that properly, it can lead to toxic shame. We All the time, we're beating ourselves up. Oh, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to the garden, eat some worms. We can leave in that self-rejection, or it can lead to pride, in other words, I'm going to be so prideful, just like when we feel feelings of guilt, like there's nothing wrong with me. We start doing self-justification. Or it can lead toward anger toward others. It's their fault. You're blaming everybody else for what you've done wrong. Guilt does that. But what, what's great about guilt, man, I don't know if you've ever been around people who never feel guilt. They're not very fun to be around of because they can hurt you and they don't feel bad about it. So when you feel guilty, it propels you to ask for forgiveness, to mend fences, okay? But it can lead to toxic shame. If you live your whole life feeling guilty over something God's forgiven you for, that leads to a toxic shame or again can lead to pride. And then finally, ultimately, this is where we're going to end up in heaven and God wants us to experience that abundant life we read about in chapter, John chapter 10 when Jesus says that life to the full is these things can drive us to ultimately have gladness shows the fullness and richness of life, but constant searching for that gladness can drive us to always, like hedonism, it can drive us to hedonism, always just looking for what's going to make me happy next, or i got to be entertained 24-7. So even that can be taken to a negative way. Now, the reason I just give a quick overview of all these things is you're going to see people in these stories demonstrate every single one of these emotions, and usually it's going to be, lead to some type of impairment. 
they don't deal with these emotions properly. And so a lot of times when in families we have sibling rivalries, like competition between brothers and sisters, brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters, it can lead to family dis dis dysfunction. It can lead, and a lot of times parents feed into that. And that's what we've been studying with the, in the book of Genesis, especially with Jacob and with his older brother Esau. They were twins, all right? So there's already some jockeying going on there. I think a lot of times the reason Rebecca liked Jacob is because she knew the father liked Esau. And a lot of times, listen, it's very natural for parents to relate to one child that's more like them than another, but they shouldn't favor one child more than another. Just because I relate to this child more than this child doesn't mean that I should favor or love this child more than this child. That's what happened. It led the sibling rivalry here. These guys were very different people. Uh, they're always competing, just like a lot of times brothers do, but it, it didn't lead to something healthy. So eventually, Jacob, a little sharper, a little more shrewd than big, strong brother here, and, and so he tricks him into a deal. He tricks his dad to give him more of the inheritance. It doesn't go well at all. And so eventually it leads to rage, the anger Esau has. He doesn't use his word. He doesn't say, Jacob, you hurt me. It was like Esau's telling people, I'm going to kill my brother for cheating me out of what's mine. So Rebecca, Jacob's mother, hears about it. She says, Jacob, you got to get out of here. You've got to flee. You need to run. I, I know you've never met my brother, but i got a brother that lives up in Haran, so I need you to get out of here, leave Beersheba. And this is a long hike. This is a many-week travel. Um, I need you to get up to Haran and meet him, okay? So Jacob leaves Beersheba. He goes to Haran, and on his way, he has the vision, like we talked about last week, of the angels descending and, up, and ascending, and like, how do we get to God? And God communicates to him, I'm going to take care of you. This is an unconditional covenant with you, Jacob. I'm going to take care of you despite all your flaws, even though all the mistakes you've made in the past, I'm going to bless you. Now, Jacob arrives near Haran. Word gets back to his mom's brother. His mom is Rebecca. She had a brother named Laban, okay? Um, word gets back to Laban, Jacob's uncle, that Jacob's in the news, uh, or that he's in town. So, Jacob runs to meet him, and he embraces him, and he kisses him, and he brings him to his house. Here's the emotion that they're having at first. He's glad. And Jacob tells Laban all that had happened. Like, here's what happened. Me and my brother Esau, like, I'm your nephew. No, we haven't met. Like, we, uh, your sister had a twin. Um, and, and so these, he goes back to all the story and deception, how it messed up. But what we see here is the reaction a lot of times we get when we go home for the holidays. Okay. A lot of you visit and go see extended family for the holidays, right? So it starts with glad. It starts with you walking in the door, right? And everybody's like, oh, it's so great to see you. I haven't seen you so long. And everybody's hugging and they're happy. And you share a couple of stories or whatever. And then after two or three days, then you remember why you moved away in the first place. And you're feeling shame and fear and loneliness and sadness and anger and guilt and all those past family hurts start coming back. People start bringing up a story. You remember, oh, this is why my sister drives me crazy. You know, it's like fish and your family. About three days, you can't stand to have it anymore, all right? So that happens to a lot of us that are in dysfunctional situations. I love my family. It doesn't apply to my family at all. I know my mom's watching. She knows we always get along. Never any problems in our families. And I can see you nod your head too. All of you live in perfect families like mine. That's great. But for everybody else in the, in the uh, congregation, I, I want to share this with you. Um, Laban says to him early on, everything's going great. Hey, you're my bone, my flesh. You can stay with me as long as you want. I realize you're in trouble going down there. So we talked about this last week though. Watch what happens next. Laban says to Jacob, this is where it all starts going wrong. Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? They have gone from, you're my family, you can stay with me as long as you want, we'll work whatever, we'll take care of each other's needs, we'll work in a symbiotic relationship, to a transactional relationship. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. If you won't do this for me, then I won't do this for you. 
And so there's all time this deal making in dysfunctional families. Instead of doing things out of love, it's out of ultimately self-benefit. How can I do something for you so you can do something for me? It's ultimately selfish, and that's what's going to happen here. Now, Laban has two daughters. The name of the oldest was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak. Now, let's just pause there, okay? This is a nice way in Hebrew of saying that Leah was just ugly, all right? She is one ugly woman. It's about, she's about as ugly as you can be. Like, this tells you a little bit about the school I went to. Our cheerleaders used to say this to other players when they'd step up to shoot free throws. The girls would say, U-G-L-Y, you ain't got no alibi. You ugly. You ugly. Like, that was okay back in 1983, okay? Um, and so that's Leah. She, she's not an attractive woman. She's an older sister, and you can see how, uh-oh, this is going to lead to problems. Because older sister is going to be competitive with younger sister. And not only that, younger sister is beautiful, not only in appearance. In other words, she's got a beautiful face, but she's beautiful in form. She's a 10 all the way around, and older sister ain't going to like that. There's going to be some competition there. A lot more I could say here, but I'm not going to say another word. I'll just get myself in trouble. So, because she's a 10 all the way around, Jacob loves Rachel. And he said to his uncle Laban, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. You're asking me what you can do for me, what I want my wages to be. I want to marry my cousin. Okay, now a lot of you are like, oh, that's weird, that's weird. Okay, listen, if you just go 100 years back in Tennessee, everybody's marrying everybody's cousin. It was very normal back then, and that's why many of you look like you look now, okay? <laughs> there are some cousins got married. I can just look at you and be like, ah, there are some cousins in there somewhere down the line. I know that's how it worked, okay? So don't start judging them from 4,000 years ago. Your family was like that too, Okay. Um, the family tree don't fork very far. You know what I mean by that, okay? So uh, Laban says, well, it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. We got a deal. Let's shake hands. You work for me. You can buy my daughter from me. Not going well. You can buy your cousin. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. And everybody goes, Oh, that's right, like five people got it there. Like, oh, uh, they're in love. It's so great, okay? Then Jacob says to Laban after seven years, give me my wife that I may go into her, okay? Hebrew word there, so that I may join with her, okay? For my time is completed. The transaction is complete, all okay? right? We made our deal. Give me this beautiful woman. I've been working for seven years. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place, and they made a feast. And part of the feast back then is everybody's just drinking. And on this night, he makes sure that Jacob has just one too many. How do I know that? You're about to find out. Here it is. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. So it's pitch dark there in the tent. Like, again, I mean... He, this is another reason why you don't need to be out drinking around people of the opposite sex. This is where we get the country song. Last night at 2, I went home with a 10, but at 10, I woke up with a 2, okay? Because this is what's going to happen, Laban. So Jacob wakes up the next morning, and he's with ugly Leah. Like, it was dark the night before. Her honeymoon wasn't so bad. He was lit. That's a Hebrew word. There's a Hebrew word for that, all right? He wakes up the next morning, and it's ugly older sister, and he jumps up out of there. Can you imagine me and Lee in this situation? Like, he was like, like, I slept with you last night? Oh, like, he jumps up, he runs out to his uncle, like, what have you done to me? Like, why am I sleeping with her? Like, there's been a mistake here. And Laban said, calm down. It's just not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Now, complete the week of this one, another transaction here. Watch this. And we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Now, how would you like it if you were Leah in this situation? You know the deal that your cousin just met for you. 
She must have been okay with it because she could have easily said to him, hey, by the way, you're so, she must have known she probably wasn't going to get another. I mean, it, it's a bad thing to be so ugly that you're okay with sleeping with your cousin and hiding it from him. But now you wake up in the morning, and it was so bad last night, he has to sleep with you for another week. So Jacob did so, and he completed his week. Like, I got to do the deed seven times with you, and then I'm done. Shame, fear, loneliness, sadness, anger, guilt, hurt. How many of those do you think Leah is experiencing right now? Probably all of them. So then after that week's over, though, he gets Rachel. Okay? So it says, Bible says, Jacob went into Rachel also. And he loved Rachel more than Leah. It goes back to voices of the heart. And he served Laban another seven years. Now, first of all, they were already competitive. You already had younger sister that had more going on for her than older sister, especially in a society where women are just valued for their looks. And so here's Leah hurt. She's on the outside looking in. She's never been treated the same. Laban knew he had to offload her to somebody, otherwise he was going to have to take care of her the rest of his life. No guy would want to be with her. She couldn't find a spouse. And for seven years, before we pick back up on this, we see that he's working for his uncle, another transactional relationship. It's just an ugly situation. But it starts out, watch this, it starts out that he loved Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah in other words it's not saying at first that he disliked Leah it's just that he loved Rachel more but over time there started to be resentment because of the shame and the fear and the loneliness and the sadness and the anger and the guilt and the hurt that was going in in the marriage Watch what we see next. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, it went from, well, I love them more than you, to I hate you. I don't want to be with you anymore. I don't want to sleep with you ever, except when I have to. So when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now, it's not saying that God made Rachel barren on purpose at this point, but at this point, it is saying that there's no love loss between Jacob and Leah. But God sees this. So Leah conceives and bears a son, and she calls his name Reuben. Now, this is important. Like, you read in English, it doesn't make sense to you, but the Hebrew word here, Reuben, do you remember uh, the God who sees that Tyler preached about, the God who sees us in our time of pain and hurt? Roy, this is from the root word Roy, and Ben means son. Ben, like uh, Ben Yehuda, it means the son of Yehuda Street, okay? So the son, see a son. That's literally what Reuben means. See a son. Look here, I got a son. For she said, because the Lord has looked, he had, the Lord sees upon my affliction, maybe now my husband will love me. Now how sad is that? Can you imagine Leah when she finally finds out, and a few times that Jacob sleeps with her, she gets pregnant, and she's thinking, you know what? Not, there's nothing a man wants more than a firstborn son. Even though I know he's more attracted to Rachel, if I give him the firstborn son, somebody that's going to carry on the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if I give him that firstborn son, maybe then he will love me. And so every day when she finds out she's pregnant, for nine months, you know, she's thinking, oh, please let it be a son, please let it be a son. I know Jacob wants a son, please let it be a son. And then the son is born. She names him, see, Jacob, a son. Look, I'm giving you a son. And the response from Jacob is nothing. He doesn't say a word. Can you, like, can you imagine living in a relationship where you're always trying to be good enough? to earn someone's love. Again, transactional. That's all Leah knew. It's all Rachel knew. It's all Jacob knew. It's all Laban knew. It's all this family knew. Everything was about transaction. You do this for me, I'll do this for you. Well, then she conceived again and she bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard 
that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And so she called his name Simeon. It means, will you hear? You hear this? So now she's saying, like communicating, so that every time Jacob calls out to Reuben, he's reminded, see, I gave you a son. Every time that he calls the name Simeon, it's, hey, hear me, listen to me, pay attention to me. I'm giving you a son. Listen, see, I'm trying to make you love me, Jacob. And that didn't take. And then so she conceived a third son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me. That's what this loneliness is doing. It's driving her to try to have attachment with her husband. That's what Levi means. It means one who is attached or connected. And that's ultimately what drives a lot of us is we want connection with the people we love. Now, maybe this time my husband will be attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore, his name's called Levi. She tries and tries, and guess what we see Jacob saying throughout this process? You know what he says? Nothing. Not a word. And Leah's got to be thinking, man, there is nothing I can do to make this man love me well. It is difficult to live in a marriage where there is no love and there's nothing you can do to please him. And then, let's look at the other side. Rachel saw, here's Leah just cranking out the kids, and Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children. I mean, I mean, just put yourself, I mean, I'm just talking to you. We're, we're not all adults, but the teenagers can understand biology. I mean, just put, imagine this. How often is Jacob sleeping with Leah? Not very often at all, but it's almost like every time he sleeps with her, boom child is born like he's not with her every time he goes in sleep for her well, she's just pregnant like that Rachel she's with him almost every night but she's bearing no children and she envied her sister here's that sibling rivalry going on she's the pretty one everybody's liked her all life but now she can't have kids so she says to Jacob give me children or I shall die she wants this more than anything else in the world. Like, this is an idol to her. I just, I gotta have kids. And then Jacob's anger was kindled against her. Again, that's unresolved anger. It's not healthy anger. And he says, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Again, as if to say, obviously it's not my problem because I just sleep with Leah one time and here comes a kid. This is your fault that you're not having kids. Don't blame this on me. Am I in the place of God? He's the one that's not allowing you to have children. This is your problem. Take it up with him. Now, theologically, sometimes, listen, in narrative, in stories, sometimes people say things about God that's not true. In other words, maybe it's not God making this happen, but maybe God's just not allowing, maybe God's just allowing her to be infertile. Maybe something's going on that's causing it. But it is clear how God operates in words that he shares with Moses. I want you to catch this. This is really important. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses doesn't want to go back to the people of Israel. He's making excuses to God why he's not the guy to go to say to Pharaoh, let my people go, to be the leader of the nation. Moses says to the Lord, Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of tongue. And then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Do you see what God's saying here? He's not saying he allows people to be blind or that blind people and deaf people or mute people or people born with disabilities. He's not saying that they're this way by accident. God is saying, I made them that way. Right now, the nation of Netherlands, they brag. I read an article about this a couple years ago. They're bragging. They said, we have just about eradicated the problem of Down syndrome in our nation. Do you know how they've eradicated the problem of Down syndrome in the Netherlands? 
They do tests while the baby's in the mother's womb, and if the child tests positive for Downs, they abort them 100% of the time. And what God is saying in this verse to Moses, and Jacob's right when he's saying it to Rachel, if someone's born blind, it's not because God allowed it. It's because God made them that way. To say it again another way, there are no mistakes with God. People are born the way they're born. We're born with a propensity to illness. I'm not, yes, of course, it's a result of the fall of man in heaven. This isn't going to be a problem. But what I'm saying is when God makes someone blind, it's for a reason. We may not know in this lifetime. Sometime later, we might get a glimpse of why God did it. But it wasn't on accident. It wasn't a genetic mistake. God is doing it for a reason. And what Jacob is communicating to Rachel here, though not in a good way, but it's true. And what God is communicating to Moses, Moses, you are who you are with the gifts and the talents and the lacks of the gifts and the talents both. You are the way you are because I made you that way. You're not a mistake. And so what he would say to Rachel is, there's a reason you're not having children right now. And if you're not able to have children, and if you struggled as a family with the infertility, a lot of times you think, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? To which God would say, there's nothing wrong with you. I'm doing this for a reason. And we just say, I want to know right now. And we can feel like Rachel, like, man, God, I need you to fix this, and I need you to fix it right now. And if you're not going to fix it the way I want you to be, I wish I would just die. Why'd you make me this way? God has a reason. That's what he's communicating here. We're going to see in a moment. Now, in the days of the weed harvest, now watch this. Here's Rachel over here, no children. Leah's got these boys that are growing right up. Here's little Reuben. See, a son. Not only that, watch this. Even when Rachel has to call out the name of her nephew, okay, she's still saying, see, a son. Leah, when she says Reuben, She's also saying to her little sister, hey, see, I got a son. See, I gave Jacob a son. Now watch this. Boy, I tell you what, brothers and sisters, they have a unique ability to stick the knife in the most hurtful of places. Reuben goes out one day and he founds mandrakes. Let's just say apples so you can picture it. He goes get apples in the fields and he brings them to his mother Leah. And Rachel says to Leah, hey, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. That's an innocent ask, is it not? Hey, can I have an apple or two? Reuben, can I have a couple of your apples? And watch how the bitterness in Leah's heart strikes back, just of a simple request. She said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away from my husband? Would you take away my son's apples too? Like, is that not a shot? Like, you take my husband from me. I don't even want to give you the time of day. I don't want to give you an apple. I don't want to share anything with you. I share enough with you. Every once in a while, he'll pop into my tent, probably just because you're on your period. That's the only way I get a shot once a month. And you're going to ask me for my son's apples? And then Rachel I'm just telling you, siblings have a gift. Watch how she responds. I mean, she just cut her as about as deeply as she could. Rachel's going to cut back deeper. She said, okay, then Jacob may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's apples. In other words, the only way he's coming over to your tent is if I give him permission. Is if I tell him to. Because otherwise, he would never want to sleep with your ugly old hind end. You can just see it, man. So Jacob comes in from the field the evening. Leah runs out to meet him and says, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's apples. So he lay with her that night. In other words, he's her hooker for the evening. She just bought him for some apples. Do you see the transactional thing I'm talking about? You never want to be in a situation to where you're making deals with family. And let me say this, especially to the couples in the room. Whatever you do, don't use sex in a transactional way. 
it will not end well. It is not healthy. Oh, honey, th th this is what we teach people early on. Oh, you brought me flowers? You're going to get lucky tonight. You know what that is? It's transactional. Oh, honey, if you take out, oh, when I see you clean up the dishes, I can't tell you what that does for me. That's transactional. Honey, if I do this for you, will you do this for me? Honey, I've been good for you the last month. Will you do this for me? Why aren't you taking care of me like their wife? Why can't you be more like this person? Don't use sex in a transactional way. It's something only between a man and his wife, and it's meant to be freely given and freely received. Now, perhaps this may be the saddest thing about this entire story. Rachel had the one thing that Leah wanted the most, and Leah had the one thing that Rachel wanted the most. Why? It's probably because they just wanted what the other one had. And this is a lot of times what both men and women do. We're all the time competing. We're all the time comparing. How can I one-up you? How can I show off what I have? That's what we do a lot of times on social media. Even though we don't mean it, that's the way the other one receives it. Let me put a picture out there of how great my marriage is. Oh, well, let me put a picture out here how great my kids are. We just had the greatest time. We took a greater vacation. We've got the nicer house. Look at this great new car I just bought. All these materialistic things we do, intentionally or not other people often see those things and we compare ourselves like why can't my husband make more money why won't my wife work so we can have these things oh you're saying you want this well why don't you go out and get a job and that envy drives us to do damage within our familial relationships this is the first takeaway of the day listen other than getting us to doubt God's word, Satan's number one tool for stealing our joy and causing disharmony in the home, here it is, it's to get us to focus on what we don't have instead of what we do. We see it right in the beginning of the book of Genesis, right? God has said to Adam and Eve, you can have fruit from every tree in the world, but from this one tree, you can't have the fruit. So where's Eve hanging out the next day? Wanting the one thing that God told her she can't have. God says, man, take all the money you make, live on 90% of it, give the 10% to the work of the Lord, at least 10% to the work of the Lord. And we're just like, man, is that before taxes or after taxes? This is why Moses writes, this is the, the ultimate of the commandments. It covers everything. When we steal, it's because of this. When we kill, it's because of this. When we lie, it's because of this. When we have false idols, it's because of this. Ultimately, it all goes back to the 10th commandment, which is this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, not your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey, in case you're just confused, or anything that belongs in somebody else. In other words, don't focus on what you don't have versus Focus on being thankful for what God has given you. Focus on what you have. Be thankful for what you have. Be happy for what you have versus all the time striving, straining for what others have. And man, it is difficult living in this society because, listen to me, every advertisement you see on TV is trying to make you unhappy with what God's given you already. Everything. That's why I literally, I never watch commercials. If you ever ask me, oh, have you seen this commercial? The answer will be no. I don't watch any live TV. I record everything. If, if I can't record it, like, then I just walk away during the advertisements because I am not going to be indoctrinated with what the world tells me that I got to have to be happy. I'm not going to allow myself to do this. I even watch shopping. I don't like going to stores. I don't like going to malls. Because every time, every store you walk by, everything they put in the window is what? To ultimately convince you, don't be happy with what you have. Take the treasure the Lord has given you and buy this. It'll make you glad. 
It's not just women are this way competing with one another. Men do it too. We see the business thing between the uncle and the nephew, the father and the son-in-law. They're making business deals. And without going into all the details of the story, like Laban's trying to rip Jacob off. Jacob's trying to rip Laban off. They're, they're, they're kind of, they're not treating each other with integrity in their business deals. So Jacob's son starts seeing, or Laban's son starts seeing what Jacob, their brother-in-law slash cousin's doing, okay? And he hears that the sons of Laban are saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has gained all this wealth. Now, it's not just because they love their dad, because ultimately, eventually, what belongs to Laban is going to belong to Laban's sons. Everybody follow me? So even this is selfish. They're not defending their father here. They're defending it in their own inheritance. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. This happens every time that you have a transactional relationship. Do you hear what I just said? doesn't matter what kind of relationship it is. If it's transactional, sooner or later, you will begin to view that person as an object or a means to an end instead of loving them as a partner and re- in family or business or school or a teammate it's not going to end well because eventually you're not going to give to the other one what they expect so the lord said to jacob return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred and i will be with you so jacob sent and called rachel and leech in the leah in the field where the flock was and he said i see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before but the god of my father has been with me you know that i have served your father with all my strength I just want you to see, that is a lie. He took care of his flock better than he took care of his father-in-law's flock. It's not true, but this is what pride does. When you feel a little guilty about it, you go into that. Here it is, self-justification. I've always been great to your dad. I've always treated him right. Yeah, your father has cheated me, and he's changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. In other words, God's on my side, not his. I know I'm right. And then Rachel and Leah, they jump in against their dad. And they said to him, is there any portion or inheritance left to us of our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us and he has indeed devoured our money. Like he's spending all our inheritance over there. What's, what's he ever done for us? So Jacob arose and he set his sons and his wives on camels. And he drove away all his livestock and his property that he had gained. And his livestock and his possession that he had acquired in Padam Aran, that's the region around Haran. And he went to the land of Canaan, his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household God. She's still an idol worshiper. She goes in while his dad, I know I'm leaving town. I'll go in there and I'm going to steal his gold statues or his silver statues. She grabs them and she takes those idols with her. Jacob tricked Laban. That's what Jacob means. He ja- Jacob, Jacob, Laban. That's literally what it says. Jacob, Jacob, Laban. The Aramean, by not telling him that he intended to flee. Like, he's not even going to give him a chance to say goodbye to his grandkids. He didn't tell him he was leaving, all right? So he fled with all that he had, and he rose, and he crossed the Euphrates, and he set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. He's heading back to Israel. And when it was told to Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him, pursued him for seven days, followed close after him into the hill country of Gilead. And Laban overtook Jacob, and now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsmen pitched his tents in the hill country of Gilead as well. And Laban says to Jacob, when he catches up with him, he says, what have you done? That you have tricked, that you have Jacobed me, tricked me, and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why did you flee secretly and trick me? And did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs and tambourine like like we could have had a party. Why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters for well? You have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm right now, Jacob. But the God of your father spoke to me last night and said, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And now you've gone away because you long greatly for your father's house. But if you're going to do this, why would you have to steal my idols? Why would you have to steal my gods? Was it not that you took everything from me, but you had to take my gold and silver idols as well? And Jacob answered. Like, Jacob's never argued anything because he knew it was all true, except that last part about stealing the idols. Jacob didn't have anything to do with that. Now watch. Jacob answered and said to Laban, 
I left because I was afraid, and I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. And anyone with whom, but I want you to know this, anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinmen, point out what I have that's yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen those idols. So Laban went into Jacob's tent. You can just see him searching all around, no silver or gold idols there. So then he goes into Leah's tent. He's searching all around there. And then this female servant's tent, he's searching all around there. He doesn't find them. And then he went out of Leah's tent, and now he's going into Rachel's. And Rachel knew he was coming. Now watch what happens here. Now Rachel had taken the household gods, and she put them in the camel's saddle, and she sat on them. And Laban felt all around the tent, like there's the camel sitting in the tent. She's sitting on the camel with the silver and gold idols underneath her. He's feeling, he's looking, searching the whole tent, and he doesn't find him. And then she said to her father, he comes over to her to search the camel, and she says, let my, my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. In other words, Daddy, I'm having my period. And so he searched, but he did not find the household goods. In other words, she pulled the thing here, the women have been doing 4,000 years, it still works with dads today. My daughter does something she's supposed to do. Oh, daddy, I'm on my period. Okay, I got to go. Like, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. Like, men just get squeamish about that. Like, oh, oh, and so he's out. But notice how she's deceiving her father. Not only is she deceiving her dad, it's over her idolatry. And then Jacob became angry. Whew, all these voices of the heart. And he berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Now, I'm, I'm going to pause there, but there it is, that pride again. He can't even admit that he shouldn't have left. He can't even use his words to say, Laban, it just won't go around. I'm sorry I sinned against you. I was feeling guilty about that. Total disaster. Now, in the midst of all this, I want you to see what happens with Rachel. After they have gone through, Leah's had her children. Watch this. It says, then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her, and he opened her womb. It's always in God's time, never a day early, never a day late. She conceived, and she bore a son, and said, God has taken away my reproach. In other words, her toxic shame is what she's saying. It's taken away my shame. And she called that boy's name Joseph saying now watch this finally she's pregnant finally she has the not just any child but now i'm going to give jacob a son and her first words out is i'm going to name him joseph may the lord add to me another son did you catch what she just did god finally gave her a son she sees there's the boy and the first thing she says is, now God, give me another one. Man, if that's not telling you the human condition, you know, it's said of everyone, when you poll people, you ask people, how much more money do you need to be happy, to be comfortable? And if people make 80000 a year, they say 20% more. If I just made 100 a year, we'd be comfortable. And then guess what? The people who make 200000 a year, guess what they say they need to be happy? 20% more. You ask a millionaire how much more money they need to be happy. Do you know what they say? 20% more. This is what you're never doing. Like, God gives you what you say you want, then you get it, and your heart's like a vacuum. It's just, I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more. And eventually God does give her another child. They journey from Bethel, and while there's still some different from Ephrath, Frada, it said it sometimes, Rachel went into labor, and she had a hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, the childbirth killed her. She called his name Ben-Oni. Remember this means son, son of my suffering. She was going to name her son for him always to remember, You're the child that killed me. Man, Rachel messed up. But Jacob steps in, he says, no, for the first time we see Jacob step in and say, no, I'm going to start naming my kids. 
and I'm going to give them names that will mean something that will impact their lives. I'm not just going to give them a name because I like how it sounds. I'm going to give them a name that I want them to be who they are, just like God changed my name from Jacob to Israel. I'm going to call him son of my right hand, Benjamin. Benjamin. This is my right hand man. And that's where Jacob starts to change as a person is when God changes him as a person. Now, I want to close with this thought. Rachel and Leah, both of these girls' story point to Jesus. The first one is this. Watch this. So Rachel, when she dies from childbirth, her name means little lamb. That's what Rachel means, little lamb. That's what I named my daughter. We didn't know what we were going to name Jonna. Uh, we were going back and forth. And right after she was born, here she comes, pulls her out, the doctor gives a little smack, and she cries like this. She goes, man, man. And one of the nurses says, she sounds like a little lamb. And it just hit me because I just, coming out of seminary, New Hebrew, I'm like, the word for little lamb is Rochelle, Rachel. So I named her John and Rochelle. It means little lamb. But I want you to see the play on word. Man, this is just how God works in a sovereign way. Watch this. So Rachel, the little lamb, the lamb, she died and she was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is, she's buried in Bethlehem. We read later, she's born in a cave or she's buried in a cave in Bethlehem. And later, the Lamb of God would, would be brought to life in a cave in Bethlehem. That, I mean, that's something that no Jew would miss when you're reading the Hebrew. The little lamb dies in here, the little lamb is born in here. Okay? But this is the big story. This is the right cross, man. This, this is the number one thing, what I'm getting ready to share right now. This is what I want you to take out. If you haven't heard anything else, I want you to see what happens in Leah's life. I don't know that Rachel was ever right with God when she went to the tomb. I don't know. I mean, she, she was idol worship. Last we saw, like she still wanted to worship those idols. But Leah finally got it. Watch. You remember when the Lord saw that Leah was hated and he opened her womb? Rachel's barren, watch. Leah conceived and she gave birth to Reuben. Maybe now my husband will see me that I've given him a son. And then later she names the son Simeon. Maybe now my husband will hear me. Maybe now my husband will love me. Maybe now my husband will treat me right. And then she has that third son, names him Levi. Maybe now I'll get an attachment. My husband will be attached to me and I won't be lonely like I've always been. Jacob just wasn't coming around. He wasn't giving her the love she deserved. And then something happened between child number three, Levi, don't miss this, and child number four. So she conceived again and she bore a son. And she said, this time, I'm just going to praise the Lord. And so she called his name Judah, Judah. I mean, the Lord be praised. And then she ceased bearing. In other words, when she had that fourth run, somewhere between son three and son four, she realized there is nothing I can do to make Jacob love me. I'm still going to be good to him. I'm still going to love him. I'm still going to, yeah, of course. I want to get all those things. Should I have those things? Of course I should. But you know what? I'm not getting him from him, but here's what I'm going to do. Now that I have this fourth son, I'm not going to name him after my neediness for my husband. I'm going to name him after the only thing that I really do need, which is a relationship with my God. In other words, I'm just going to praise the Lord with this one. And whether or not the world's treating me right, whether or not my job's treating me right, whether or not my school's treating me right, whether or not my family's treating me right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be grateful for what God has given me. And I'm just going to praise the Lord anyway. And I'm going to go to the Lord, and I'm going to praise him, and I'm going to find my knees ba basically through a relationship with my Savior. Man, Leah got it. Do you see that? And I don't want you to dismiss that part. Watch this. The Lion of Judah, it was the descendant of Judah, the Messiah, Jesus, was a direct result of Leah persevering through a loveless marriage. 
You don't hear many people preaching that today, do you? Man, I just don't feel like I'm very loved. What if she would have tapped out after the third kid said, I'm just not going to be faithful to him anymore. I'm going to go on down the road. What if she would say that? But instead she says, you know what? I'm just going to praise God anyway, and we'll see what the Lord does with this child. Well, I'll tell you what the Lord did with that child. He brought her around the Savior of the universe. So I just want you to know, like, we're always looking in this lifetime, like, why am I going through what I'm going through? Why am I in this awful situation? What's God going Leah never knew the answer in her lifetime. But today she knows. Because ultimately, the child that was born to her was the child that saved her, that paid the price for her sins, and the sins for all of us. And see, and then, and listen, this is just what God does. And this may not be even what you want to hear right now, but I'm just speaking the truth to you. Listen. Sometimes the way God gives everyone else what they need is by not giving us what we think we need the most. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes the way God gives everyone else what they need is by not giving us what we think we need most. But ultimately, 